Hello, welcome to Time Capsules. I'm Carl Qualls, professor of history at Dickinson College. We've constructed this video series to illuminate some moments in European history. For my students, this series serves as a backdrop to our class discussions, but all viewers are welcome, and we hope that you too will enjoy unearthing the past. In January 1914, two powerful alliances wreaked havoc on each other, but the road to the Triple Entente and Triple Alliance was lined with twists and turns and potholes. How did Europe shift from general stability after 1871 to all-consuming war? The Great War is known as World War I in many countries, not only because it was fought on more than one continent, but also because the lead-up to the war was as much about European countries' conflicts in Africa and Asia as much as in Europe itself. In August 1914, Gavrilo Princip assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. Too often this is viewed as the beginning of World War I, but that's far too simplistic. Thousands of books have been written on the origins of the Great War. This short video will seek to provide a brief outline of the alliance system that many have blamed for a war mistakenly viewed as inevitable. Many people also assume that the two great alliances in August 1914, the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente, were fixed and uncontested. But if we look at the major countries' geopolitical interests, we'll see that there was much more fluidity in possible alliances than is often imagined. Within an alliance, member states disagreed. Moreover, there was open cooperation and discussion between countries and rival alliance blocs. Into the early years of the 20th century, we had a multipolar Europe with a balance of interests that kept things relatively stable. Except for French designs on alsace lorraine there was no significant territorial claims among major powers in Western Europe. As the Ottoman Empire began to decline, however, the major powers began to eye potential gains in Southeast Europe. As imperialism gained force at the end of the 19th century, great power conflict was based on clashes in Africa and Asia. France and Britain were rivals in much of South Asia and Africa. Britain and Russia were involved in the great game in Central Asia and Persia. The two newly united countries of Italy and Germany had, along with France, designs in North Africa, and Britain garnered control over most of Egypt. And this is only a very short list. A map of imperialism in Africa and Asia shows how pervasive European conquest was. Within Europe itself, France was still seeking to reverse Germany's gains from the Franco-Prussian Wars of 1870 and 1871. Russia and Austria had conflicting interests in the Balkans, and Italy and Austria skirmished in the Adriatic. Russia wanted free access to the Straits so that it could get into the Mediterranean, but Britain and others were keen on keeping Russia out. In this multipolar system, no country had an upper hand, and multiple alliance partners were difficult to create because there were so many conflicting interests across the globe. Starting in the 1880s and lasting for about two decades, European governments sought to find greater security and protect their interests. Oftentimes this meant creating short and long-term alliances with other countries to balance out the power of a perceived enemy. Otto von Bismarck, the great Prussian dis diplomat, was keen to protect German interests after the 1870-71 unification of the German states but to do so in a way as to avoid conflict whenever possible. Having defeated France in 1870-1871, Germany's great fear was that France would somehow find an ally that would force Germany to fight on two fronts simultaneously. The Russo-Turkish Wars between 1868 and 1878 saw Russia re-emerge as a power after its inglorious defeat in the mid-century Crimean War against a coalition led by Great Britain. Now the declining Ottoman Empire was caught between the Russian Empire, British power, and the proximity of the Austro-Hungarian crown. From this point forward, the disposition of territories and peoples in the Balkan Peninsula became a matter of interest for numerous European powers. The Triple Alliance of 1882 of Germany, Austria, and Italy kept the latter two from open warfare. Austria had long occupied parts of the Italian peninsula and had openly challenged Italy's unification. However, Italy was concerned with the French takeover of Tunisia and feared war against a larger opponent. Germany and Austria had been allied since 1879, but the secret treaty that formed the Triple Alliance shows the concerns about French and Russian forces, and also the uncertainty of Italy's loyalty. In the event of a Russian attack on Austria, Italy had promised its neutrality, thus preventing Austria from fighting on two fronts. Italy would assist Germany if France attacked, but both Germany and Austria promised to aid if France attacked Italy. Bismarck maneuvered the alliance so that the potential conflicts between Austria and Italy in the Balkans and the Adriatic and Aegean Seas would all be solved through consultation and mutual agreement. This managed to hold the alliance together until 1915, when Italy entered the war with the Entente 
after promised territories on the Adriatic coast. The Triple Entente of Great Britain, France, and Russia took much longer to come together, in no small part because Britain had concerns about both France and Russia, but also because Triple Alliance members, particularly Germany, were able to engage effectively with Britain and Russia for many years, thus preventing multinational agreements. A first step was the 1887 Reinsurance Treaty between Germany and Russia, which forced both powers into neutrality should either be involved in a conflict with a third country. This kept Russia from a conflict with Austria and the Balkans, and prevented France from creating an alliance with Russia against Germany. In the Mediterranean Agreement of 1887, Britain, Italy, and Austria united because of mutual concerns about French designs on the Mediterranean. The agreement also halted Russian intervention in the Balkans and Straits, and thus limited its power into the Mediterranean also. After Bismarck left office in 1890, the system began to change dramatically. Most importantly, the German-Russian Reinsurance Treaty was allowed to expire, which opened the door for France to take Germany's place as Russia's ally. Why did Russia consider switching? Well, Germany passed a new military spending bill soon after its treaty with Russia was allowed to expire. Increased military spending, combined with the increasingly erratic actions of Kaiser Wilhelm II, raised concerns in Russia. Large French loans to Russia also helped to turn the tide. Moreover, in the early 1890s, when Germany and Britain traded lands in Africa, and the British press lauded a visit from the Kaiser to London, and even suggested that London had joined a quadruple alliance, it appeared that Germany and Britain might be growing closer. Britain was Russia's chief rival in Afghanistan, Persia, China, and the Turkish Straits. So many in the halls of power in St. Petersburg began leaning towards France, so that Russia would not be isolated by a British-German Union. France also wanted to block Germany. Russia was more concerned with limiting Austria-Hungary in the Balkans. Although there was Germanophobia among Russian policymakers, Russian hostility was mostly a factor of Germany's support for Austria and its perceived closer relations with Britain. The resulting Franco-Russian alliance in 1894 required both countries immediately to mobilize and deploy their entire forces at the first news that any member of the Triple Alliance was mobilizing. The goal was to force Germany to fight on two fronts simultaneously. France's key goal since 1870 was revenge, or at least containment of the new German state in Central Europe. Because of its ties with Germany, Austria would not likely join France in a war against the Kaiser. Russia, on the other hand, had concerns about German power on its frontiers and divided Poland. Although the Three Emperors League of 1873 briefly brought Russia, Austria, and Germany together, Russia's interest in protecting fellow Slavs in the Balkans, particularly the Bulgarians and the Serbs, conflicted with Austria, making a long-term Russo-Austrian agreement implausible. Great Britain was still not ready to join France and Russia, especially after the 1898 Fashoda incident, which saw French troops march to the Southern Nile to challenge British possession of Egypt. There could have been a war in 1898, yet just a few years later, France and Britain became allies. Why was this? French diplomatic posts changed as often as the weather, and policy swung between anti-German and anti-French. France wanted Alsace-Lorraine back from Germany, and wanted to pressure Britain and Egypt in return for concessions in Morocco. The Kaiser was openly hostile to British actions in the Boer War in southern Africa. So France sought to bring Germany into a coalition against Britain in Egypt and the Suez Canal. When German negotiators refused to join France and Russia, unless France affirmed Germany's right to Alsace-Lorraine, France flipped to an anti-German stance and began to look to Britain as an ally. This period shows the interconnectivity of concerns within Europe as well as European clashes on other continents. In 1904, Britain entered the Entente Cordiale. Why would Britain and France end nearly 1,000 years of intermittent fighting? Well, both sides realized that they were relatively isolated. France's only ally was Russia, which would soon lose the disastrous Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. Britain's only ally was Japan, which would hardly be useful during a European war. But to join together and avoid isolation, they had to end their numerous disagreements in their colonial possessions. Several agreements were signed that, for example, gave Egypt to Britain in return for French control in Morocco. Other agreements ranged as far afield as Newfoundland and French Guinea, to Indochina and Siam, now known as Thailand, and all the way to Nigeria and Africa. German attempts to check France in particular led to the two Moroccan wars in 1905 and 1911, which served only to drive Britain and France closer together. In 1907, the Anglo-Russian Convention brought the two French allies into a mutual agreement. This set of agreements settled competing colonial claims in Persia, Afghanistan, and Tibet, 
ending over a century of Russian threats to the jewel in Britain's crown, India. Thus, by 1907, we see the beginning of these two great alliances that came to blows seven years later. The multipolar Europe of the 1870s had now given way to a potentially more dangerous bipolar world of two grand alliances, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. From this point forward, the Balkan Peninsula became the center of European instability. The very next year, in 1908, Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia, which was part of the Ottoman Empire, just one day after Bulgaria had declared its independence from the Ottomans. Neighboring Serbia and Montenegro and all of the great powers condemned Austria-Hungary for what became known as the Bosnian Crisis, or the First Balkan Crisis. Serbia, Italy, and Russia, which all had interest in the region, would never trust Austria again. In 1911, the Second Moroccan Crisis, or the Agadir Crisis, saw Britain come to the aid of its ally France, when Germany sailed a warship to Morocco to protest additional French troops sent to the Moroccan interior. In quick succession, the Italo-Turkish War and the Second Balkan Crisis struck Southeast Europe. Italy attacked the Ottoman Turks in what is now known as Libya, and the relatively easy defeat of the Turks signaled an open opportunity for the nationalities in the Balkans to do more than question Ottoman control. Bulgaria wanted more ter territory than it had received in the First Balkan War. Serbia and Greece fought back against the Bulgarian aggression, and Bulgaria ended up losing more of its original territory to Serbia, Greece, and Romania. Serbia, backed by large French loans, emerged as the major power in the region, and the Balkan Wars in particular increased nationalism in the region. This is just a short and simple overview of some of the major events and alliances prior to World War I. If you think this short video was complicated, you don't know the half of it. These wars and alliances could have gone in many different ways. Many monarchs were intervening and changing their minds. National militaries argued with their civilian governments. Career diplomats often had little respect for elected officials. These internal machinations and political intrigues could have taken things in many different directions. Moreover, policymakers often were operating with bad intelligence, often clouded by historical hatreds. The increasingly belligerent and nationalistic presses made things no better. It was not uncommon for foreign ministries to plant stories in other countries' newspapers in order to shape public opinion. In the years leading up to the Great War, all the great powers, and many of the minor ones, provoked other countries and violated agreements. Moreover, nationalism around Europe, including in the Balkans, was on the increase. Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty, which ended World War I, stated, quote, The Allied and Associated Governments affirm, and Germany accepts, the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the losses and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed on them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. Germany, in short, was to blame for the war. Its blank check to Austria, it was argued, caused Austria to attack Serbia. But is it fair and accurate to blame Germany for everything? France had long been constructing alliances to box in Germany. Russia mobilized its forces before war was declared. Britain's military advantage still greatly outpaced Germany's. Serbia, and not just its nationalist assassins like Gavrilo Princip, had been unsettled for a decade since Serbian King Alexander had been assassinated by conspirators within his military. Civilian officials struggled to deal with the power of its military, nationalist conspirators, and a fractious political system that led to numerous economic, political, and military quarrels between Serbia and Austria prior to 1914. So who's to blame? A lot of people. World War I was not an inevitable conflict, but rather one made by people with consciences, making conscious decisions. Although many of the outcomes were unintended, men were making clear choices, not merely allowing the wheels of history to turn on their own.